Wine to Five is partially funded by Alborello Luxury Hand Soap, an unscented must-have accessory for anyone who loves wine, cooking, and food. For more information, visit alborellosoap.com. It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five, entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Welcome back to Wine to Five. This week we are away from the mic, and Steph, well, where in the world is Steph? Steph, where are you? Right now, uh, I think I'm stuck in United's economy class, like somewhere over the Atlantic. So, I will not be asking you what's in your glass, because I'm guessing it probably ain't good. But, uh, unless it's a Bloody Mary, which will dull the pain. Yeah, something like that. I think so. (laughs) Well, what's not painful is this really great interview that we have to share in the meantime, guys. Oh, yeah. We are super giddy to bring you a chat with Susan Castrava from Wine Enthusiast Magazine. Yeah. And here's a little bit more about Susan. She is the executive editor of Wine Enthusiast Magazine. She oversees the editorial direction of the print magazine as well as all digital initiatives for the media company and is a formal taster on the magazine wine tasting panel. Susan is the author of numerous food, wine, and travel books such as Opus Vino, a comprehensive volume of worldwide wines and wine regions, Greatest Escapes, a series of books on literary travel, and Pairings, a guide on matching the eclectic wines and foods of the world. Before relocating from Sonoma to Manhattan in 2005, she was senior editor of Wine Country Living, as well as a contributing writer and or editor for Savor Wine Country, Marin Magazine, the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, and several travel magazines. So guys, please sit back, pour a glass, yeah, you too, Steph, and enjoy a little chat with Susan Kostrava, Executive Editor, Wine Enthusiast Magazine. Thank you, Susan, for joining us. Today we have Susan Kostrava from the Wine Enthusiast Magazine joining Valerie and I today on Wine 25. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, let's get right into the interview. Um, so tell us, Susan, a little bit about what's your typical day like as an executive editor? Well, my typical day as an executive editor starts with a lot of email, which obviously we all experience in our jobs now. Um, Usually I will check my email in the morning. I get a lot of it, sometimes 50 to 100 emails in a night. And then I try to meet with my senior editors in the morning. We discuss pending projects. Uh, We talk about layouts, SERPs for the upcoming issue. And then, you know, a lot of meetings. We're, We're in the midst of releasing a lot of digital content right now. And we've got some new projects we're working on. So really like to check in with them and just see where we are with everything and and make sure we're on track. Nice. I love the Wine Enthusiast magazine. And I just feel like I didn't know enough about what an executive editor does and what that day looks like. So thank you for sharing that with us. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we'll get to the catalog piece in a minute because I I like the catalog a lot, too. (laughs) But (laughs) it's like... I, I don't know. I call it like kind of like wine porn almost. And that's where my chiller came from and everything. And I just love it. But as far as the magazine goes, mm-hmm. why don't you please tell our listeners why people should read the Wine Enthusiast magazine? Well, one of the things that I think uh, when I came on in my role was very important to me was to make sure that we were targeting the audience that wasn't being spoken to with the other magazines that were covering wine. And so I really believe that we're offering a, a really unique Uh, voice for wine readers and wine lovers. So we bring wine lifestyle, beer and spirits. uh, We bring that in an educated and modern way. And and we hope that you'll have fun in the process of learning. So I'd say that, you know, we're education and entertainment combined. And that's something that unfortunately hasn't been seen a lot in the wine space. So, uh, you know, we want people to enjoy themselves. That's what wine's all about. Oh, how perfect that you're on our show because we say that we are a wine edutainment show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's 
Perfect. And your writers, if we can just sidetrack really quick, I mean, you have masters of wine writing for you guys. <laughs> you have a whole range of wine experience. So it's not just like somebody's like, oh, I just love wine. I want to write about it. These are people who really have studied it and know what they're talking about. Yeah. I mean, we have a team of tasters who some of them have decades of experience tasting. Some of them are newer, but you know, most of them have been through different certifications. I mean, they're qualified, but they're also people who are great writers and storytellers. And that's something that, you know, is not always easy to find actually uh, a great taster who's also a great storyteller. But I think we've done a really good job of finding those people. So it's, it's, it's an eclectic group and it's a very qualified group in, in my opinion. And I have a side yeah. question too. How long has the magazine been in existence? Um, it's been around since the late 80s, actually. Uh, I believe the founding year was 1988. It's been through a lot of changes over the years and, and pretty massive changes over the last five years. But throughout its existence, it's always been about making wine accessible, making it entertaining, and sort of speaking to people in a way that, that like I said, is, is entertaining and educating at the same time. Yeah, totally. Well, so how does the Wine Enthusiast catalog complement the magazine? The catalog was in existence before for the magazine, actually, that's even okay. older. And, you know, it complements the magazine because it's, these are all the tools that you need in order to enjoy the lifestyle that we write about in the magazine. So obviously it's glassware, it's, it's uh, you know, corkscrews, it's wine refrigerators, all that stuff that kind of helps you enjoy the lifestyle that, that we are passionate about. Everything is in the mag, in the catalog for you to, to actually buy. And, and uh, you know, they rotate the, the products pretty frequently. So hopefully, you know, you'll find some really cutting edge uh, products in there that are related to wine. They do spirits and beer as well in the catalog. Yes, they do. Yes. We're big fans of the Fusion stemware, actually. Oh, yeah. We've been using that for quite a while and we just love it. I use it at home as well. <laughs> it's good for me because I tend to break glasses. So, <laughs> And these, they don't break easily. No, they don't. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying to bounce them. I've seen it happen. I've seen them bounce, but I'm not <laughs> saying to go do that. But we actually that's that's our primary drinking vessel in the house right now is the uh, the fusion stemware. We love yeah. it. You guys recently published an article about Cremant, right? Which was really interesting because that's the style of sparkling that we've mentioned briefly on the show, and and I'm a huge fan. But there are other obscure wines and styles that I know our listeners are looking to try with the Wine to Five Challenge. What about you? What's the most obscure wine or style that you've been into recently? Well, I would say for the magazine, in addition to the role that I do um, as executive editor, I'm a taster for Greece. So I'm rating and reviewing Greek wine. And one of the wines that I've been tasting recently that sort of fell out of favor and for good reason for a long time in the U.S. is Greek Retsina. So Retsina mm -hmm. is a pine resin wine. It's a really ancient wine that's been made in Greece for many millennia, basically. But what's happening now is these producers are making really just delicious Retsinas that are more modern in style, a little easier to drink. And they're great. And they're really, really versatile with different types of food, seafood, etc. So I would I would encourage everyone to try them. If you see them on the market, they've gotten much better. And if you're a fan of any sort of grilled seafood or anything, vegetables, etc., that's a great wine to try. That sounds like a lot of fun. I've only had it like, I think twice. And one time my friends had me taste Retsina blind and that's so easy to do, actually. I don't know about yes. the new, really new styles, but, you know, blind traditional Retsina was easy to identify. Yeah. But, but also kind of I wasn't expecting anybody to throw that in the uh, tasting lineup. So that was fun. Yes. I wish it would show up in more blind tastings. And, um, <laughs> and listeners, yeah, if you haven't gone out and tasted one for the hashtag WD5 challenge, definitely do it. There is a histor and historical reason why the pine resin was put in wine. And so even the story of it will definitely broaden your wine horizons a little bit as well. Yeah, exactly. And so the uh, types that are they're making now, they're making it out of a out of a variety called a Sirtico, which is, is grown on Santorini and in other parts of Greece. It's really fresh and really delicious. Um, and there's a particular one called Tear of the Pine, which like, again, I would say people should try. It's, it's, it's really a lot more sort of balanced, fresh, and food-friendly, I think, even than some of the, the more traditional ones. So Nice. I'm writing that down. I'm like, I'm going to go look for that. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so let's talk about something else here. And this is a, a Chardonnay conversation that will continue from Valerie and I's last episode recording. But 
tell listeners why they should drink Chardonnay for breakfast. We've mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> we have really, I mean, we've been on the show recording in the morning hours and been drinking and saying, oh, we're having some breakfast wine right now. But mm-hmm. you guys have mentioned it in the winemag.com. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, obviously it's no new thing to have wine or spirits with breakfast. That's like, obviously the tradition of brunch is all about mimosas and Bloody Marys. Um, etc. So Chardonnay is one of those wines that it's so versatile and it's great with the type of food that you often will eat at breakfast. So eggs, bacon, sausage, you know, these are hearty flavors um, and Chardonnay can stand up to that, but it's not super heavy. You know, I think that it's it's got that weight, but it's not a, a super heavy thing to drink in the morning. So it really complements the food and it's a fun thing to do. It's something different, again, different than doing mimosas and Bloody Marys or or something like that. I mean, and I believe very much that sparkling wine throughout the day is always a great thing, but I like the idea of Chardonnay. Oh, yeah. You're a good woman. Exactly. You're a good woman, Susan. Oh, we agree on a lot of things here today. So that's that's just another one of them. I know. I want to hang out with Susan. And, and before we go any further, uh, congratulations on your Woman of the Vine nomination. It's a nomination. It's an appointment, appointment to the board. Yes, thank you so much. I'm really excited. I'm so impressed and and thrilled and love what, what's being done uh, with Women of the Vine. So I'm excited to be involved. Yeah, I think Steph's been to, too. And that's where I think you guys yeah, met. Yeah, we hooked yes. up there. Yep. And, uh, yeah. and then hopefully, Val, you'll be able to meet uh, Susan there, too. I'm hoping. I'm hoping to get out there next year as well. Great. But besides the world of wine, which brings us all together, what are your interests outside the world of wine? I mean, I think a lot of people think we just day drink all day. We don't do anything else. But I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that you do. Um, I am a big reader. So I studied literature and journalism in college. And books are a, a passion of mine. Not that that should be super surprising for an editor. But that's, that's something that I love, 19th century literature, especially in Russian literature. Mm-hmm. And then also music of all kinds. I'm definitely a music geek. It's something that I considered going into uh, as a writer before I got into wine and food and, and lifestyle. So, you know, and then beyond that, as far as sports go, I scuba dive and I snowboard. So <laughs> I have all wow. sorts of things to do when I'm not drinking wine. And I try not to drink wine when I'm scuba diving and snowboarding, but the rest <laughs> of them I can drink wine and do. <laughs> Although I remember I didn't learn to ski till I was in my mid thirties and my girlfriend always starts her day on the slopes with a Bloody Mary. She says it just kind of takes the edge off, uh-huh. makes you think less, makes you relax more. Just one. I'm not saying getting tanked yeah. by any means. You but, might be right. You know, you might be yeah. Right. I don't know. That's, that's, and that's what I learned to do. So. All right. Yeah. Well, what's your What's the next uh, scuba diving trip coming up for you? So I'm going to the Cayman Islands in December. Nice. There's an one of the islands is called Little Cayman, and and there's a really great dive site there. So my husband and I are heading there, getting out of the cold, and running a house on the beach and diving from the shore. So that sounds excited. fabulous. Oh yeah. Well, we do have one final question before we let you go and get back to being executive editor. And this is one of our questions that we love to ask all of our guests on the show. Mm -hmm. And it's to share a funny or embarrassing wine story because we all take ourselves a little too seriously sometimes and and we all make mistakes and put ourselves out there, but uh, we survive it and uh, we have then the (laughs) stories to tell about it. And I Mm -hmm. think that's what connects us all. So tell us your story. Well, I think Probably one of the most memorable sort of embarrassing stories that I have was uh, one of, when I first started with the magazine, I was covering South Africa as a taster and uh, went on some tours of wineries in South Africa. And one of the, the first ones I went to, we were in the tank room and uh, the winemakers were tasting and spitting wine into the gutter, but they were doing it with a lot of skill. And, uh, you know, I had never done that. I'd never had to stand up and spit onto the floor into a specific area. So, <laughs> so let's just say I tried to be really cool about it and it didn't really work. And we all got a little bit of a, of a spray all over us, including people with white pants, the whole deal. Oh, so, oh this is good. 
Yeah. So I learned after that how to do it, but it was, it was just one of those moments where, you know, again, everybody just laughed and, and I had to admit I'd never done it. And, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. There's no elegant way to do it. And, uh, you know, people over years become experts in doing it, but it was a little embarrassing. <laughs> Yeah, I believe it's Hose Master of Wine who says he spits like a rabid llama. <laughs> and I try to keep that in mind whenever I'm practicing my spitting, too, because, again, we take a lot of exams, we spit out a lot. And it's funny because if you've been to trade events, yes. you've had that happen where you've gone into the communal bucket and everybody else's backwash oh, yeah. comes back. It's just not fun. No. And you're just like, well, there goes your makeup. And yeah. But at the same time, you know, we, we have to do it. And it happens to everyone because we're... Right. Well, you know, it's, again, it's, it's, you just kind of move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have to do it because I mean, you're tasting, I remember I used to be embarrassed to spit and I was up in Merano yeah. at the international wine festival near the Austrian border up there in Italy. And I was just so embarrassed to, to reach over and grab that spit mm -hmm. bucket. But I realized I had to, because you're tasting what, a couple hundred wines a day. Absolutely. And, you know, so guys, use the spit bucket. If you just don't wear white pants, man. <laughs> Pretty all. much. Yeah. Just wear black <laughs> and you're good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is good. And I have never had to spit onto the ground like you're describing. So, I, you know, I might need some tips next time I see you at Women of the Vine. I'm not, I'm not actually sure that it's done everywhere. I just know it was being done there. So yeah. it's like, okay, this is the way, you know, when in Rome, you have to do what, do what they're doing. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And then you learn. So that's good. Well, let's get you back to work. And thank you so much. But one more thing is, how does everybody connect with you? Where can our listeners find you on social media? Okay, so you can find me on Twitter at uh, S-U-S-K-O-S-T-R-Z-E-W-A, which is my long last name. Um, I'm on Instagram under the same name. And I would also encourage everybody to go to winemag.com, which is our website. And that's uh, winemag, all one word, dot com. Uh, and you'll find all sorts of great articles by me and all the, the rest of the staff here and hopefully learn a little bit and have fun doing it. That's great. Awesome. Susan, we can't thank you enough for joining the ladies at Wine to Five today. And we're uh, we're excited to hear about your podcast. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We are launching a podcast in November, which will be rotating topics, rotating editors, again, just playing off of, of all the edit that we run and trying to illuminate some of these great stories that come out of the wine and, and spirits industry. So hopefully everybody tunes into that. Yeah, we will look out for that. Great. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Susan. All right. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Well, that was so much fun, and we hope you all enjoyed your time with Susan as much as Val and I did. Oh, my God, yeah. We had such a good time with her, guys. We hope you did, too. And we will be back behind the mic next week for some more wine edutainment. Connect with Val on Twitter at WineGalUnboxed and on the Vino with Val Facebook page and on Instagram as Vino with Val. And you can find me on Twitter at Albarello Soap and on the Albarello Soap Facebook page and YouTube. And you can visit us on our Wine to Five website, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Google+. And if you want to build your collection of wine books or accessories, please check out our online store also located on our website. Our show would not be possible without you, our listener community. To find out more about how you can support Wine to Five Show, please go to patreon.com, Wine to Five Podcast. We hope that you'll share Wine to Five with your friends and online community. We certainly appreciate all your involvement and feedback. Leave us a burning wine question or comment on SpeakPipe. And while you're at it, go out to iTunes and show us some love there in the form of a glowing iTunes review. We're also on iHeartRadio, so please share our fun Wine to Five community with all the wine lovers in your life. And one more thing, don't forget to use the hashtag W25Challenge when you are trying new wines and new drinks, and you can win an opportunity to co-host a show with us. So until next week, cheers! cheers. Fly safe, stuff. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5 and tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips.